Hello, welcome to the Theology Study. Uh, I, maybe some of you have been waiting for me to uh, up, upload a new Theology Study. And, you know, I've been out of town and then I was on vacation and just, then I had to catch up from vacation. So I took a little break from uh, uploading the midweeks. And uh, now we're doing that. So today I want to uh, talk about the elements of the gospel. And when we think of human preaching and how God uses human preaching of the gospel message, we can identify uh, three elements, and there may be more, but we easily can identify three elements of the gospel. And the first would be expl explanation concerning salvation, uh, invitation to respond to Christ, and then, of course, the promise of forgiveness and uh, faith or the promise of eternal life, excuse me. And, and so I, I thought I'd go through those briefly. Explanation of the facts concerning the salvation. That's part of proclamation of the gospel. Anyone coming to Christ for salvation must have at least a basic understanding of who Christ is and how he meets our needs for salvation. And so, so that's part of it. Thus, such an expl explanation, you know, if you're explaining the, the facts or the basic basis of who Christ is and how he meets our needs for salvation and so on, it could include these three things. And the first we would find in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all have sinned, therefore all need a Savior. And then the, the next principle we see that's important is Romans 6.23. The penalty of our sin is death. And, and so all have sinned and all are facing a death penalty for that sin. Then the final one that we can identify is that Christ died to pay the penalty for our sins. Romans 5.8. And you say, well, that doesn't sound like much. You know, when God is working in human hearts, those principles go a long ways. And we, we have to remember that, you know, when, as I've talked in the past, when, when we think of Lydia, the seller of purple, outside of Philippi, and, and it says God caused her heart to want to hear the preaching of Paul, you know, which the word preaching essentially means proclamation. And, and you know, if God is causing someone's heart to hear the gospel, once you share it, it will bear fruit. It, it, even in, and you say, well, I'm not very good at sharing it. Your talent at sharing the gospel is not essential to people becoming Christians or, or finding salvation. Because it's God causing their heart to hear that truth. But we're part of it and we're partnered with him. And so it is important. So if we think about this, though, if all we do is hear the gospel, it's not enough. If we only hear, understand, and agree with the gospel message, we only have an intellectual experience, not, or an intellectual, yeah, an intellectual experience, not a, not a genuine experience, not a, a foundational experience. We develop a comprehension of salvation, but salvation is a spiritual experience and a personal relationship experience. And to have that, we have to respond to that knowledge, not just possess the knowledge. And that's true of a lot of things in life. Uh, we can know a lot of things. It doesn't mean anything if we don't respond to that knowledge, you know, appropriately. Or act on that knowledge is probably a better way to put it. So when we develop a knowledge of the gospel, we act on that knowledge by responding to the person of Jesus Christ. Thus, an invitation becomes important. It allows the individual to move from comprehension to experience. So when we think, well, why, why, why should I witness? Why should I invite people to, to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Because it gives them this opportunity to move from knowledge to experience. And salvation is in the experience of a personal Savior. So as we look at that, we move into this understanding of the invitation to respond to Christ personally 
in repentance and faith. And those, so our response to Christ or our response to the invitation it shows up in two, twofold, repentance and faith. The New Testament talks about uh, people coming to salvation in terms of personal response to an invitation from Christ himself. And we can see a scripture where Christ is giving an invitation to all of us, really. In Matthew chapter 11, if we read verses 28 through 30, we see the Lord crying, come. Come to me, all who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Place my yoke over your shoulders and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble. humble. Then you will find rest for yourselves, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when we, we think in those terms, firstly, that ultimately is all the invitation necessary. You know, it, 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 because God can act on that invitation. If someone was never never heard a person witness, but read those scriptures and and the Holy Spirit worked in them, and they knew, oh, that's an invitation to me. They can respond to that invitation and know Jesus Christ. And, and so we don't really, when we invite people to know the Lord, I'll put it this way: we don't really. We just let them know that Christ has already invited them. And, and I think that's, that's something to remember, that, that I'm, I'm just letting people know that Christ has already invited them to be in personal relationship with them and, and that they can do that. They have that freedom. I'm just spreading the good news that already exists. And, and so we see that. Now, because the Bible is the living testament of Christ, it is important for people to understand not just that these words were once upon a time said or spoken long ago, but that Jesus is even now saying these words to us at this very moment. Come to me. You see, Jesus is still alive. So it's important that we think of Jesus as speaking these words directly to us in the moment. This is something that can be shared when we're sharing our faith with non-Christians and witnessing that Jesus didn't just say these words. He's saying them to you now. Come to me, all you who are tired from carrying heavy loads. That's, that's a witness because it's scripture. We already know it's a witness the Holy Spirit anoints. Now, John talks about the need uh, for personal response, and we see that in John chapter 1. If we look at verses 11 and 12, it says this, speaking of Jesus Christ, he went to his own people and his own people didn't accept him. However, he gave the right to become God's children to everyone who believed in him. So we see this faith response that becomes necessary. We see here the necessity, first of all, of response. One must do more than hear and agree. Response is the result of believing. Belief motivates action. And, and I think we want to remember that, that that's essential, you know, um, that's why James is able to say faith without works is dead. That have you, if you notice the things, if people truly believe something, they act on it. Uh, you know, people, nobody jumps off of, say, a skyscraper if they want to live because they believe in the power of gravity. People take certain medications or they take the advice of their doctor because they believe in it. Uh, they eat a certain way. You know, if people who want to be healthy, they, they eat healthfully because they believe a truth about that. See, belief leads to action. People obey the speed limit when they know a policeman's ahead because they believe they could get in trouble for speeding. Uh, and so belief motivates action and therefore if people believe in god it will motivate action the first action will be a response to salvation to believe in the lord jesus christ there will be a, a response of repentance and so on so we'll talk about that a little more um, notice the call in revelation when we talk about invitation Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 says this, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let those who hear this come. Let those who are thirsty come. 
but those who want the water of life take it as a gift. Now, note that it is the spirit and the bride in cooperation saying, come. Uh, this is significant. The Holy Spirit works with us, the church, which is the bride of Christ, works with us to send out a call. And so we see that, that uh, we are in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, working with the bride. We, the bride, are working with the Holy Spirit, vice versa, to say to a world of lost people, come. And that is evangelism. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would receive from him and speak it to us. So when that's what's happening, that the, Jesus is telling the Holy Spirit, say, come. The Holy Spirit's saying to us, say, come. So together we begin to say, come. And, and what you have to learn from that scripture also is that when you, when you start inviting someone to hear from the Lord, the Holy Spirit begins to speak that same message to them. See, that's the point. If you say come, the Holy Spirit's also saying come. There's an influence there. And those who have ears to hear what the Spirit says will come. And so it's nice to know you're being backed up by the Holy Spirit, even if you don't say it as well as you think you should. And, and so what is involved in coming to Christ? Repentance is part of coming, and that's important. That when we think about that, that um, God calls us out of our old life into a new one. So even when Jesus says, you have heavy burdens, come to me. Why is he saying that? So he's calling you away from that burden. He's calling you away from that life that wears you down. He's Thus, he's calling you away from sin and to righteousness because there's healing in that. And so we must make this U-turn. That's what repentance is. We change directions. We begin turning away from sin towards Christ. That's part of responding to the invitation. And, and we see that. In fact, God's word translation translates the word repent this way it, always. It says, change the way you think and act. Honestly, that's one of the best definitions of repentance I've ever heard. What is repentance? Change the way you think and act. And you know what? If you change the way you think, you'll change the way you act. It, it, all, it works that way. And, and it couldn't be more clear than that. Now, another thing, as I've talked already, belief leads to action. So faith is also part of this process that my, I, I repent because of faith. I repent because I believe. That's one of the actions. Then as I begin to change the way I think and act, that's all happening because of faith and belief. So that's part of it. We change and trust. And we trust in God's patience with us is part of it too. And so when I when I start changing, I, I learn immediately that I don't change immediately, right? And so when, when I came to Jesus and I begin to try to change the way I thought and acted, I begin to realize, wow, uh, I keep going backwards. This, this doesn't happen all at once. And immediately I have to have faith in God's grace and mercy as he patiently waits for me to grow. That's good news. You know, seed sprouts before it bears fruit. It, and when it, it germinates, when it germinates and it begins to sprout, uh, then it's growing and then it pops out of the ground. And as a little sprout, it doesn't bear fruit. It grows more and more and more. And as the plant matures, the fruit becomes obvious. And that's, what, that's how salvation works in our lives. That it's, it germinates, it grows, it sprouts out of the ground. The plant matures and then we begin to see fruit. And, and that's the process. And God understands that process. And so I have faith in God's patience and mercy and grace and kindness as I grow to maturity, my fruit-bearing maturity. 
and, and that's good news. We also trust in God's promise to us. And, and that's the next thing. When I respond to the Lord, it's because I'm believing in his promises. And, and so we see that a true invitation is a call away from the old to the new and a belief in the Savior. Now, when we look at the promise and forgiveness, the promise of forgiveness and eternal life, that's twofold. I act on, God says, if I confess my sins to him and believe in him, receive him as my Savior, I receive forgiveness. That, that wipes away those sins. Now, this is something I take on faith because I, you know, I still remember them. They're still, there. you know, to me, they're still there. I did it. And yet I believe that God has washed those away. So I receive a promise of faith. Or, or I believe in the promise of forgiveness, excuse me. And, and, and I receive that promise even by faith. So we embrace our faith, right? So I'm encouraged when I think about God's promise of forgiveness and eternal life. I'm encouraged to stay on the path of change and growth because of the promises of God. Um, and we embrace faith because we believe by faith that we're forgiven in a supernatural way. And then we also continue on the path because we believe this path is the path, the narrow path to life. And, and we stay on this path because we believe it's taking us in the direction of our final reward. Once again, I'm holding to a promise of forgiveness, but also eternal life. We see that in John 3, 16. For God loved the world this way. We gave, he gave his only son <clears throat> so that everyone who believes in him will not die but we'll have eternal life. So what we need to remember is that the gospel call is important. And it's important that we listen to God and share that call with others. God has placed on us the responsibility of sharing the gospel message with others. Without, and, and, you know, sometimes, well, if God knows who's going to get saved, why witness? I've heard that before. Because the Lord told you to. He has chosen to work through you and to partner with you. And, and we have to respond to that responsibility. Because we know this. Without the gospel call, we could not know to believe. And, and, you know, I think about the Ethiopian eunuch when he's trying to figure out what he's reading. He's reading Isaiah, and Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I unless someone shows me the way? He understands that he needs someone who will partner with God to help him uh, respond. And, and that's what Philip does. Romans 10, 14 says this, but how can we call on him if they have... How, excuse me, how can people call on him if they have not believed in him? How can they believe in him if they have not heard his message? How can they hear if no one tells the good news? So we, we right away see there's this responsibility on our shoulders to tell the good news so that people can hear and respond. That's why we share the gospel. Another aspect of the importance of the gospel call is that God addresses us as people in the fullness of our humanity. He does not save us without seeking a response from us. Thus, the gospel is addressed to our intellects by explaining the facts of salvation in his word. He speaks to our emotions by issuing a heartfelt personal invitation to respond to the gospel, right? Causes our heart to hear, responds to our emotions. He speaks to our wills, our human will, by asking us to hear his invitation and respond with repentance. By so doing, God never fails to recognize that he put in man what the technical term in Latin, of course, the imago Dei the image of God. And he, he speaks to that. 
and man must respond. That's it for now. Next time we'll begin talking about the doctrine of regeneration. Look forward to seeing you then. Lord bless.